Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 343rd New Social Environment. I'm Malva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming artist, writer, and activist Greg Bordowitz, whose uh, retrospective uh, Greg Bordowitz, I Wanna Be Well, is up right now at MoMA PS1 and will be on view through October 11th. I'll drop a link in the chat, run, go check it out. He's joined today by The Rail's very own Nick Bennett and Yassi Alipur, and to close us out in style, we have musician Laszlo Horvath, who will close us out with a performance today. Uh, so looking forward. Finally, we've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And I think it's worth taking a moment to remember that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle in freedom. Uh, in that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together behind the scenes here at the rail. I'm dropping that right now. Um, there you go. But we'll get right into it. Uh, today, it's my honor to welcome our wonderful guests of this lunchtime. Uh, artist, writer, activist, and comrade Greg Bordowitz teaches in the film, video, new media, and animation department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I attended for a while. And while he's not doing that, he moonlights as a member of the faculty at the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. His lifetime of work is, is the subject of a traveling retrospective exhibition spanning over 30 years titled I Want to Be Well, and it's currently on view, as I said, at MoMA PS1. Previously, it was at the Art Institute of Chicago, and his films and other works have been screened and exhibited at a variety of locations, including the New Museum, Artist Space New York, the Tate Modern, MoMA, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. He's the author of numerous texts, including the fantastic The AIDS Crisis is Ridiculous and Other Writings, which came out with MIT Press, uh, and many other works. Um, and today he's joined by my comrade in arms, writer and thinker Nick Bennett, who is special projects editor here at The Rail. Uh, previously, he was a curatorial assistant, and he organized as a part of that the ongoing exhibition Artists Need to Create on the Same Scale that Society Has to the Capacity to Destroy, what a line, uh, which was exhibited widely at the 58th Venice Biennale, among other venues. And finally, they're joined by the luminous Yassi Alipur, Iranian artist, writer, and folder. Yassi currently lives in Brooklyn and wonders about paper, politics, and performance. She received her MFA from Columbia and is a teacher at Columbia and SVA in New York. She's also currently a resident at the Sharp Valentis Studio Program, and exactly a year ago, kind of to the day, uh, she was in conversation with Greg in our 2020 July-August print issue. Uh, so excited to see how you pick up that fantastic conversation in the time since. Uh, Yassi, Nick, take it away. Dreaded, the dreaded you are muted, Yasi. I know. I'm like, that's always a good start. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Malika, thank you so much for that beautiful intro. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and thank Greg for joining us here. As you said, Malika, I wonder if it has literally been a year, but around a year ago, Greg, I sat with Greg through Zoom when sitting through Zoom with people was uh, much more new, at least. Uh, and I feel like I had all these questions that is about the history of this city um, and uh, questions about what it means to be a contemporary artist today. Uh, and around a year ago, you very generously and patiently answered all my absurd, uh, urgent questions. And now it's been a year later and I have so many more for him. Um, also wanted Thank Nick uh, for joining me in this conversation. Nick has been, um, well, because you said, a comrade, uh, but also a source of inspiration for a while. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Nick, I'm gonna pass it to you. Um, thank you, lots of thank yous to start with. I also want to sort of set the intention today with uh, gratitude, thanking you, Greg, for joining us. Um, it's an honor to be in conversation with you and to follow up the great conversation that you and Yasi had. Um, so with that, I'm actually, I'm gonna pull up the slideshow and just get right into it. But actually, uh, Greg, maybe if you just wanna say hello in a few words before we just dive into the poll. Yes, I too, I just wanna express my gratitude. Thank you to 
Navika and um, <clears throat> and Yasi and Nick uh, and thank you also to Fong and Charlie. I see you out there as well. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm honored uh, to be here. And uh, just to add, uh, um, I'm actually currently the director of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago Low Residency MFA program. That's currently my position at the Art Institute. I did originate in the film, video, new media department, um, but that is for the past eight years. Uh, I've been the director of the low residency MFA program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, before we see any of this work, I also do want to acknowledge uh, some folks. Uh, so please bear with me, it's short. Uh, none of the what you're going to see of the show, Greg Bordowitz, I Want to Be Well, would be possible without Stephanie Snyder, who is the curator at the Cooley Art Gallery at Reed College. Five or six years ago, Stephanie contacted me out of the blue. I did not know Stephanie and she said she had long admired my work and wondered if I ever had a retrospective. And frankly, because I'm an artist who does many different things in many different fields, uh, as we'll talk about, I never really expected or conceived that my work could be brought together in an exhibition. It was Stephanie Snyder as an originating curator who brought the uh, show, I Want to Be Well, together as a retrospective. And um, I'm very grateful because Stephanie has continued to be uh, a uh, necessary and significant participant in all of the iterations of the show. The show did travel to the Art Institute of Chicago and I'm grateful to the chief curator, Ann Goldstein, and the curators of that show, Robin Farrell and Solvay Nelson, who helped me enlarge the show and add new works that we'll talk about. And I'm also grateful to Peter Ely and Kate Fowle at PS1, who have made the new iteration possible. The show is now up at uh, MoMA PS1 in Queens. So thank you to all. Um, no artist makes work alone and uh, always in conversation and always with the uh, supports. And I've been very fortunate to have the support of all those people, uh, including my partner, Christine, who is uh, on this uh, web uh, webinar now. So thank you all. Well, excellent. Um, okay, I am going to share the screen just a moment here. So my first question, Greg, uh, centers around the statement that when approaching PS1, uh, there is this large final banner that as you can see, everyone that says the AIDS crisis is still beginning. Um, I know that the exhibition and the programming at PS1 was working with uh, another organization called What Would an HIV Doula Do? And I'm quoting directly from them to note uh, the spe this special sort of anniversary, that is 2021, that uh, to quote says, summer 2021 will mark 40 years since the US public health enterprise and media first reported on a set of conditions that would come to be known as AIDS. On June 5th, 1981, the Centers for Disease Control published a report entitled Pneumocystis Pneumonia Los Angeles in their Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. A month later, on July 3rd, the New York Times published the article rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals. It was not until sev several years later that viro virologists isolated and named human immun immunodeficiency virus, HIV, as the viral cause of AIDS. So 2021 is a complex year in that it does mark uh, 40 years of the first sort of reportage of this ongoing crisis. Um, it, obviously though precedes this 40 years and will succeed this anniversary. Um, and as this work says, it is still beginning. Um, in the wonderful exhibition and, and viewing through everything, I noticed that David Barr of the Gay Men's Health Crisis, I believe it was in Habit, says this exact statement. So my question is, um, where did this statement originate and what uh, is its meaning to you sort of now and over time? Um, I don't know. I'm perfectly willing to accept that David Barr said it first, although, to be honest, it's something that we were saying uh, uh, for a long time in the 90s. Uh, there, there was um, 
the AIDS crisis isn't over, the AIDS crisis ain't over. Those were banners that we'll, we were carrying uh, in the 80s and into the 90s and 2000s. Uh, the AIDS, we disagreed with that, both David and I and others disagreed with the notion that it's not only is it not over, it's still beginning. And the AIDS crisis is still beginning is a true statement. Uh, if, if we're lucky to survive uh, ecological catastrophe and climate chaos uh, in 100 or 200 years, historians will look back and say in 2021, the AIDS crisis was still beginning. Today, we say the AIDS crisis is, crisis is still beginning. There's around 36 million people with HIV around the world, somewhere between 20 uh, million or so um, are receiving uh, HIV drugs. Uh, that's up from a few years ago when I was doing the show originally. Still, there's you know, around 10 to 15, 20 million people not receiving the life-saving drugs that I'm receiving. And there is a marked increase of HIV transmission around the world uh, and in the United States. There are pockets in the United States where there are epidemic numbers of uh, infection. There are places around the United States where it is very difficult to get HIV medications, including medications called PrEP, which are medications for HIV negative people to take if they wish to prevent themselves from getting infected with HIV. Those drugs are costly. They're not available evenly throughout the United States, uh, especially in the Southern United States where also we see a very large increase of uh, HIV transmission. Before the COVID pandemic, the funding uh, was decreasing on a global level for HIV. Uh, it was very hard to uh, maintain consistent funding. Uh, it was decreasing. Uh, HIV was, is, was following the same path as other urgent concerns, not necessarily considered um, a crisis any longer or framed as a crisis any longer, even though there are millions of people who are still getting HIV, dying from HIV and um, being infected with HIV. Uh, and there's also this persistent idea that, um, at least in this country, that AIDS is only or mostly a gay white man's disease. That was never true, uh, is not true now. Um, the largest uh, number of people uh, with HIV, the, HIV is one of the leading causes of death among women around the, wor the world. A large portion of that statistic are women who live in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's still a tremendous divide between the global North and global South uh, in terms of healthcare delivery, which again reflects a divide between the uh, Northern part of the United States and the Southern part of the United States uh, and the Southern hemisphere. So it is absolutely true to say that the AIDS crisis is still beginning. Uh, I, you know, regardless of who said it first, uh, I uh, decided to produce a banner and uh, make it very prominent. Uh, it's been an outdoor or public feature of the exhibition since uh, Chicago. And um, I'm very interested, actually it comes from a, a uh, banner I produced for an installation from 2001. So the, the first iteration of this as a banner in an exhibition was in 2001 at the, uh, uh, the MCA in Chicago. And uh, I like the awkwardness of still beginning. It's not grammatically correct. Um, it's interesting that Tokyo, Palais de Tokyo is possibly gonna show this banner in two years. And so I've been talking to French translators about how to translate the awkwardness of still beginning into French. Uh, Cause still contains for us, English speakers still contains the notion of stillness or stasis. So it's not, you can't properly translate it as the AIDS crisis is not over. Uh, so we've been working on that. So it's, what is a, a still beginning? Um, and it can be read in a number of ways, like it, that it, it continues to begin, it is at its beginning, it is at a stasis point, a still beginning. 
Uh, so that's the way I think about this uh, banner. I think that's that some... actually, I, I, sorry, Yasi, I was just, no, gonna, it's fine. I was just going to hand it to you because that I think kind of goes nicely to storytelling in a way, but I, I just want to mention, Greg, I didn't bring, I didn't mean to bring it up as like a, who said first, but as you said in, uh, in the beginning, you know, there's, it's not just the singular artist and um, it's just, it's fascinating because of uh, the, all of the kind of thoughts, words and things coming out of this time were, as you've talked about, very consensus driven. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I admire it for that consensus driven aspect. Thank you, Nick. I, I'm not. I'm not interested in the original authorship either. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping David. I'm hoping David Barr is here, um, or he'll watch a recorded version. That would be more of an in joke between me and David Barr. We were so close and in touch with each other every day. At that point, we're still very good friends. But during the '80s and '90s, we were mm -hmm. speaking daily and planning actions together. So that was more of a kind of in joke to David than it was any kind of uh, anxiety or feeling that uh, you had attributed uh, some authorship to someone else. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Greg, I'm really moved by this idea of um, a joke that is happening in different time frames. Like maybe he'll see it somewhere in the future and it refers to this time where we were constantly talking to each other. And Nick, it's interesting, Greg, you gave us so much where I'm like, whoa, now I have 85 different questions that I hadn't thought about, but I will try to pace myself. It was also really moving to hear you talk about the notion of still beginning, uh, thinking about talking to you around a year ago when we didn't know when this show was going to happen. We knew it was coming, but in that moment, with like the stillness of all the museums, um, and it still feels like something that is moving. Um, or, well, something I was thinking about is, as you said, it's really complicated and so moving to see how this retrospective or survey of your work uh, functions, because it's an impossible task. Uh, your work is so multifaceted um, and everything's kind of weaved together, but this in this like complicated way of like you asking these questions in many formats over the years which is even a challenge for someone who's trying to interview you. Uh, I think I mentioned in the original interview where I constantly wonder which of your multifaceted existences am I calling for? Like, which Greg do I have a question for? Uh, but as Nick mentioned, I think I found this in one of your earliest piece of writing where you could talk about storytelling. And for me, that's been a good way of thinking about your practice in many different ways. And it's interesting because to me, it seems like you're really serious about what it means to tell a story. It's never that linear. It's never about like a beginning and an end. You never take your subjectivity for granted. Um, it is always a mixture of the socio-political as much as it is uh, very frank about your lived experiences, your embodied experience is so important to it as it is your fascination and commitment to thinking deeply about language. Um, Greg, that ended up being a good way for me to think about this exhibition and how the pieces come together uh, in this retrospective, because it's not done in a simple linear way. The works are very much in conversation with each other. And you mentioned that the other, we briefly talked about this the other day, these elements that run through the show. There's all these ways where as you're moving, you can weave the show together. There's this red line that runs through the exhibition. Um, there's the race car as a theme. There's all these different themes that constantly come back. Uh, there's the clouds. There's how the sounds bleed into from one room to the next. There's your debris poems that repeat in different rooms. But all of these elements that kind of hold us as we move through the, this decades of work are complicated and like deeply ephemeral. Uh, it's, not, it's not something simple or linear. I ask very uh, non-question questions. I wanted to hear your thoughts about storytelling and how this exhibition came to be. Sure, that was an excellent uh, set of questions, Yasi. Thank you, and I always appreciate talking with you. Um, storytelling is very important to me. I um, uh, was first uh, known uh, and most involved in video making practices. Uh, and I am a kind of post-minimalist generation, which was looking at um, 
the way to reapproach pictures. Um, uh, definitely very much influenced by Douglas Crimp and the pictures generation in the art world. So uh, reclaiming narrative as a way of um, making art, reclaiming images uh, rather than non-representational art. Uh, I draw a tremendous amount of influence from uh, feminist video practices uh, and um, and postmodern practices of the period. Although uh, my relationship to narrative is um, nuanced in that I, I would make a distinction between um, say the epic narrative structure and the classic narrative structure. So uh, the epic narrative structure like what the Bible, Gilgamesh, uh, the Mar Barada, uh, I'm not comparing my work to any of these great things, but I am talking about the structure. You can also think about old novels uh, like um, Cervantes or Rabelais, um, <clears throat> or even postmodern novels like uh, Foster Wallace's uh, Infinite Jest, uh, and we're of the same generation, uh, actually the same age. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, or would have been had Foster Wallace not un sadly committed suicide. Um, so I'm really interested in, in stories that kind of uh, are spiral in structure, mm -hmm. uh, stories that lead to other stories, that lead to other stories, that lead to other stories that are spiral and that they might uh, thematically return to uh, a point or a theme, but then go off into another direction and spiral backwards. I'm very interested in recursivity um, so I'm really interested in like the and, 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 and structure rather than any kind of classical three parts, uh, beginning, middle, denouement, end narrative structure or three act structure. I don't work within the three act structure. Um, and so that's a comment about narrative stories, uh, are important because I'm very interested in the notion of testimony and witness. And I draw a specious but useful distinction between testimony and confession. There's, they're really wrapped up in each other, but uh, for the purposes of my work, I would say that testimony is always given uh, asking for witness, uh, you know, telling stories that are relevant to other people because they're having the same experience. And I get this also from say a filmmaker and choreographer of Von Rainer, who in the 70s said, my work is the, per the personal is political, quoting feminism, the, per per the personal is political insofar as I tell stories that are actually other people's stories, relevant mm -hmm. to other people, the mm -hmm. stories I share with other people. And uh, that's true of mine as well. My work appears to be and is deeply personal. But I don't, I'm not a confessional artist. And that's the distinction. I think that the confession, and again, this is a really vulgar distinction. If the testimony is for asking for witness, in my mind, the confession is asking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not so interested in, in a confessional mode that asks for forgiveness or even um, empathy from people who already aren't empathetic to my situation. Mm -hmm. Rather, I'm responding to what Jürgen Habermas called a legitimation crisis and using various media to provide legitimation to people, to myself and to people like me whose stories are not readily or easily told in uh, what we used to call the dominant media. And um, even if those stories are told, because uh, there now are a proliferation of uh, stories about HIV and living with HIV. Even though there's a proliferation, it doesn't mean that um, the stories uh, that need to be included are included. So there's the stories of, of people of color, uh, of women, of uh, people of many different genders who have been living with HIV are still are you know, fighting for recognition and prominence around a proliferation of stories that still centers around the, what should be defeated notion that AIDS is or ever was only a gay white man's disease. Uh, that's not true from a global perspective. That's not true from uh, a US perspective. It's not even true from a New York perspective. 
Uh, yes, I am a queer man and gay uh, people, gay men have suffered disproportionately, but we are one among many groups of people who have been left out of the capitalist healthcare bargain, who suffer stigma, um, who have or are not welcome uh, everywhere in society. And uh, there are many, many more stories that exist and many more stories that uh, need to be told. You know, um, Greg, it's interesting you talked about being, a, like exploring what it meant to be an artist in this like post-minimalist moment and what it meant to reclaim the narrative. It's interesting because a year ago and ever since, I think a lot about what it has meant to reclaim you uh, and refuse this notion of your work being whitewashed in a very specific way. Because I feel like your work always thought about all these different communities. There's it has constantly been about, on, like even from your earliest writing, um, like on AIDS, a picture of coalition, you talk about how we're talking about many marginalized communities. Um, it's a side note, I'm just really grateful uh, as someone who thinks a lot about marginalization, uh, that you're present, that you give space to these conversations all the time, and then that you re-emphasize this constantly. Anyway, it's next time. I want to put myself on mute. Um, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned witness, uh, Greg, and I know I, I know Yasi will probably want to talk a bit more about that. About that, um, I would like to kind of turn to your videos. So um, there's an installation image here of the first room in the exhibition at PS One. On the screen is a still from Fast Trip Long Drop. Um, I am, am, was, will be profoundly affected by these films. And um, I want to ask you a question about truth here. Um, so as a video activist during the height of the AIDS crisis and in the 80s, 90s, um, you sort of, you followed this paper tiger TV ethos of don't watch TV, make TV. And the, the goal was to inform the largest audience possible and not just trying to, you know, gain the legitimization of like a broadcast television or, or reaching or gaining that. Um, in one of the films that you can watch in this, in this room at the museum is portraits of people living with HIV, which you made for the gay men's health crisis. Um, one part of it that particularly struck me was the, I think, I believe it's at the end uh, called Boat Trip. And it is a sort of a vacation to the uh, Virgin Islands with the, the quote unquote HIV VIP, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, but uh, you're documenting this trip and you said something in it that I'm going to quote from you. Uh, you said, I decided to videotape the trip because I was videotaping the trip I became conscious of the meaning of the trip. I developed a set of expectations around the trip. I thought there was some truth at the center of it and I would find it by capturing it on videotape." Uh, end quote. And this trip was literal in that it was a trip, a boat trip, but it was also a psychedelic trip. Um, and picking up where you quoted, it, you said, uh, on the mushrooms, I realized there is no truth at the end of this experience. There was just the experience itself end quote. Um, my question is that, you know, as an artist of a postmodern generation, there is this sort of uh, scription that, you know, there's an, an acceptance of no such thing as, as an objective truth for um, artists working in that postmodern generation. Um, yet in your work, you share such a deeply subjective experience, and you've said this many times, hoping that that sharing your experience will connect with other people going through similar experiences. And I can't help but think that somewhere in there, there's a relation to a shared sense of truth. And thinking back to that, that statement that there is no truth at the end of this experience, just the experience, I, um, I'm curious how truth guided you in making these films uh, in, in the 80s and 90s and, and to the work you're making now. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick, for that excellent question. Um, 
I adopted the postmodern position, which you can attribute to a number of people, but uh, for me specifically derived from the great philosopher Michel Foucault, who died of AIDS. Um, and Foucault taught that truth is always a contestation of power. And I, I see that playing out even today uh, around, say, vaccines or um, uh, any number of issues. Um, in my life, there is the, I approach some issues uh, without neutrality, for example. So I am anti-racist. I believe we should all be anti-racist. I, I am not neutral on that position. Um, and uh, I can give many other examples, but I think that serves. I think there is, personally, as a matter of conscience, there are many issues on which I cannot remain neutral. Uh, and, um, but truth is a larger concept uh, than uh, facts. Uh, I'm also interested in how our own consciousness and perceptions of reality are uh, close, very close physiologically to hallucination. In fact, there's, there's a very thin wall between hallucination and the perception of reality. Freud taught that a long time ago. Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud taught that uh, you perceive something first and then you have to decide whether it's real or not. And uh, I, that's something that's always resonated with me. Uh, if there is, uh, so my work actually is largely about the fragility of truth claims uh, originating uh, in a moment during an epidemic where truth truly was a contestation of power. Uh, the, the media represented a general public uh, which excluded uh, anyone who was marginalized and at that point, uh, the uh, many groups that were marginalized, stigmatized and left out of the bargain and not included as the general public, the earliest modes of address in media, television, newspapers, magazines uh, were always pitched to an audience presumed to be HIV negative. And anyone who was HIV positive was left out, not addressed, whereas we, me, those of us who were part of the groups that were disproportionately affected felt that actually we should have a voice and actually the concern should be centered around us. The concern was centered around protecting a fictional general public, which is really invented by television and newspapers and magazines. And now even today in our current forms of media uh, around demographics who are identified to, as consumers. So it's um, a kind of side note, but it's interesting to me that I, uh, I, in my life, I experienced that as being a person with AIDS, marginalized. One of the first groups of people who decided we would take on the risk that we, we, were, um, we were fortunate and privileged and we'd use that privilege, we wouldn't lose our jobs, for example, if we came out as HIV positive. Uh, there were very brave few people in the early 80s who were willing to do that. Uh, if you saw a person with AIDS uh, interviewed on television in the early 80s and the mid 80s or interviewed in print, then uh, the name would be hidden, the face would be hidden, the voice would be altered, uh, except for a brave couple of people like Michael Callan, uh, Griffin Gold, a few others who are willing to take on that risk, Max Navar, people who are willing to be public. Um, and then I came, uh, I was slightly younger than them, than them, like I was 10 years younger than them. And I, so I came into the movement in my early twenties and I and many other people who were my peers decided that uh, there were enough of us who had enough privilege, like we wouldn't lose our jobs, we could take the risk. And uh, so we decided that we were going to show our faces and be public um, for other people really uh, to produce and recognize an audience of people with AIDS and those who love and care for us and support us. Uh, that was really the first audience. Uh, also, there was the idea that we could create empathy if we could put a face on AIDS. 
so um, so in, in other words, in the war of contestation over truth, we wanted to get our voices included and shift the public discussion away from the story, the narrative, that there's a general public who's uh, at risk because of this misbehaving marginal set of groups uh, who are always problematic, uh, who are queer, not white, drug using, non-conforming, and they're not part of the general public, which again, uh, the general public is a fiction. It's a demographic, it's organized to buy things. So uh, we thought of constituencies rather than uh, publics or audiences. Later, we developed a language of publics and counterpublics. We were very much then a counterpublic. Uh, Michael Warner introduced that into our language. And so truth is always a contestation and we see that playing out now in our everyday politics. There is a larger truth. I do believe that um, that crosses over into the area of the ineffable, of what can't be said. Um, so I have my analysis, which is really a historical materialist analysis or Marxist analysis, which seems truthful to me. I know that uh, many people don't share that. And then I also have, uh, I've always been religious minded. And um, so I have a other notion of truth, which is that uh, there is something larger than ourselves uh, that we live within and uh, that you can't know everything. You can't know why things happen, even though you, we can trace some causes to effects. Um, that this is also a kind of aspect that needs to be figured into uh, one's thinking. Certainly as an artist, notions of consciousness, the way that consciousness is formed, uh, which are actually old Marxist questions, um, uh, are central. Uh, to my practice. Again, I, it's very necessary, necessary, necessary for, me, for me to believe that I'm part of something larger that I don't understand. So I also have a kind of faith in uncertainty or a faith in contingency. And I find that to be humbling. Um, and it could be useful at this very moment of the great polarization and inability to uh, communicate, to get things done together that we need to get done like addressing climate chaos immediately. Uh, so um, those are my thoughts in relationship to your question about truth. If you have any, if I haven't said anything or if you have any more specific questions, let me know. I absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you touched on maybe seven things I'm curious about, but um, I'm gonna share the floor with Yasi. So <laughs> Yasi, you're yeah, just gonna, keep you forever. This, this is going to be the rest of our life. Um, no, it's, it's really interesting. I had a moment with your last answer where I was like, Greg, you can't steal the line I took from something you wrote years ago. I'm like, well, you can. Uh, but the other day I was asking you about uh, what it means to be a witness. And I was trying to kind of locate what feels really unique to me about how in your practice, whether it's your videos, your performances today, your writing, your poetry, how you practice that. And then I ended up on this early piece of writing, dense moments where you very specifically talk about the difference between confession and a testimony. And there, like, it's really beautiful how you kind of distinguish or try to understand them in relationship, like if, if a confession assumes that you're speaking to someone that has the power to forgive, a testimony is about a community. It's about speaking with others that might have shared experiences. If confession relates to guilt, testimony is about what has happened to you. Like what it, it's about a lived experience. But then, and it, Dense Moment is a beautifully written piece. Um, it's a lot of it kind of talk about how Fast Trip Long Drop was influenced by this piece of writing and there's ways that they're weaved together and you're in deep mourning in the writing for your friend, uh, Ray Navarro. But it's really interesting because you make this distinction at the beginning of the text and you're like, I'm not interested in a confession. I'm here for a testimony and go through these like 
extremely personal moments in your life. And then there's how you end that essay, which is, as you said, I'm really curious about the ways you hold down to hold on to doubt in your work. I was thinking it the other day that it's like, it's really unique that you create manifestos that are willing to have doubt or even like willing to fail in this like very vulnerable way. So I just wanna uh, read the last part. Uh, it's like the last paragraph from that text. And then the text begins with you thinking about what it, why you're waking up at 9, 20 a.m. every day, which is the time where you lost, when you lost your friend. Um, you say 9 fucking 20 a.m. and I have to change. I'm too many things, too many contradictions, too many people. I'm writing and I'm reading. I'm gay and I'm straight, working class and bourgeois, Jewish and American, faithful and hopeless, ethical and evil, reasonable and irrational, testifying and confessing, living and dying, unresolved, irreconcilable, inconclusive, contingent, mortal, ambivalent, and not resigned. Anyway, I wanna hear more. I, I wanna hear more about what it means to hold two contradictions or almost think about these constellations, like not even oppositions of, of the way you um, think about subjecthood. I don't know. I wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um... I'm not far from that now, even though mm. I wrote that 30 years ago. Um, I believe that uh, each one of us is multiple selves within a single self, uh, not in a pathological way. I just think we have different aspects of our selves um, according to context and even according to who we're relating to. Much of our identity is produced in relation. So mm. we show different aspects to different people. Uh, we are different people. I, you know, I'm a son. I'm a partner to Christine. I'm a friend. Uh, I'm the subject of this interview. I'm a, an artist. I walk into the poetry project. Uh, people recognize me as a poet. I'm usually there mm -hmm. to read. If I walk into a film festival, I'm there as a filmmaker. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I haven't put a tremendous amount of effort uh, into presenting all of these things together. In some ways, that's impossible. The show in P at PS1, MoMA, is a new experience. Uh, mm -hmm. The show in P at PS1 and in Chicago and in Portland, uh, but specifically in Queens. I'm from Queens. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's enormously important. I really do feel like I've been uh, working the country trying to get back to Birdland, you know? Uh, like a jazz musician, uh, you know, and, and now and 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 like I have a show in the borough where I was raised, and that's brought together a lot of things I never expected to be brought together. So I go through the show, which I do fairly often, because I um, mm. I think it's embarrassing uh, for an artist to do this, but I love my show. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, enjoy, I enjoy going back to the show. It's very painful. There's an underlying mm -hmm. sadness to the show uh, that's certainly perceptible to me and others who uh, are of my generation. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, I try to control when I go or who I go with. And But I've been in the show and um, uh, one time I was in the show and I heard someone just wailing, just weeping. Mm. And I uh, walked in uh, uh, two rooms away was a, an old friend of mine, an ACT UP member, person who I got arrested with, who was looking at a wall of pictures. And I, mm. and I just grabbed him and we hugged for the longest time. And I didn't have to ask why he was weeping because he is one audience of the show who can recognize who's alive and who's dead mm. in every image. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, like me and many others, experiences the great loss that my work is a record of. At the same time, there are quite a lot of young people who uh, may be for the first time encountering this history or encountering mm -hmm. this history in any detailed way. Uh, there's an audience of people who are interested because it's about HIV, but the AIDS crisis is still beginning, also functions as a metaphor uh, I am specifically talking about the AIDS crisis, but I, I, am, I am also talking about the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, there is a piece that directly addresses the connection between the 
COVID pandemic and the HIV pandemic and the ways in which uh, our government has failed us in both instances. Um, but the, you know, it, it, it can almost be like a Mad Lib, like the blank mm -hmm. blank is still beginning. Uh, my work is very much about the, the history of the AIDS activism and uh, from a subjective point of view, which is one that I actually share with a lot of people. Uh, that I, don't, I don't tell stories that I want to keep as a personal. Uh, mm -hmm. so the, the notion of subjective is interesting here. I, I mm -hmm. use my experiences, but as an artist, I know that once I make those stories public, they're no longer my stories. Um, mm -hmm. I don't hold on to uh, and try to control the meaning of my work. In fact, I don't want to live in a world where meaning can be controlled in that way. So often if people out of courtesy send me articles that they're writing about my work uh, to ask for, uh, for me to look them over, I politely decline because mm -hmm. I, and I say, this is your writing. I uh, respect it and honor it. And I look forward to reading it when it's published mm -hmm. because I don't want to play an active role uh, in that way, shaping other people's uh, expressions or interpretations. Mm -hmm. I do do a lot of work that uh, artists are called upon to do. I perform a lot of labor. Uh, artists throughout the 20th and 21st century have been called upon to uh, explain their work more, to make it accessible, to participate in all of the surrounding publicity, uh, wall labels, uh, and, and talks such as this. And I am a, a grateful and willing participant mm. in all of that because I do see these forms of, of labor as a way of expanding uh, my own understanding of my work, my self-understanding, and also being in dialogue. And I think of art as being in dialogue and also increasing constituencies. So mm -hmm. I think the most radical thing that art can do is to bring people together in a room who wouldn't imagine themselves ever sitting in the same room. And um, so that's, that's a, the radical potential for art is to create mm -hmm. new constituencies or new audiences mm -hmm. and novel emotions. Uh, mm -hmm. Emotions are historical. Uh, emotions mm -hmm. are like clouds. They go, they pass mm -hmm. through and between each other. Um, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there actually, there's a whole historiography of emotions. And so mm -hmm. I think it's part of my job as an artist to deal with contemporary emotions. I use the mm -hmm. word affect, which is more specific, but uh, affect uh, in both English and German means uh, the way you comport yourself, but it also mm -hmm. means uh, the, refers to a kind of cluster of sensations that produce emotion. So emotions, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. emotions are produced by clusters of sensations. And that's why I'm most interested in being an artist because an artist mm -hmm. deals with sensations that one mm -hmm. can have some measure of control over through craft, mm -hmm. but largely cannot control. And I'm not interested in controlling other people's mm -hmm. emotions, but I am interested in creating the possibilities of certain emotional responses. So mm -hmm. much of my work has been and continues to be devoted to creating as many moments uh, for a viewer in which they don't know whether to laugh or cry. Mm -hmm. For me, that's, mm -hmm. a, a, that's mm -hmm. kind of an ideal aesthetic state to mm -hmm. be hold something in front of you and to not know whether to laugh or cry. Mm -hmm. Uh, which brings me close to absurdity, but I prefer to understand it as ridiculousness. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. a very specific historical reference. You, you mentioned manifestos. I am very influenced by the great late Charles Ludlam, who was the a brilliant light behind uh, the mm -hmm. theater of the ridiculous. And Ludlam wrote a manifesto for the ridiculous. And mm -hmm. the first line in the manifesto for the theater of the ridiculous is, um, you are, um, oh, I'm trying to, one second, I'll summon it. Um, 
Greg, I have no, 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 no. <laughs> you are. Uh, do you have the quote in front of you? Yeah. Yeah. What, the first, the first line. You are a living mockery of your own ideals. Uh, if not, you have set your ideals too low. Yes, thank you. I will say that. Too. I just want to say it out loud. You are a living mockery of your own ideals. And if not, you have set your ideals too low. Thank you for helping this aging person uh, uh, who has too much uh, in his head. Uh, I've always just, I've always aspired to that, uh, you know, yeah. that, that, I, that I have high ideals and I can't possibly achieve mm. them. And that is in mm. some ways the comedy and tragedy of my existence as an artist. Uh, and uh, I was also, you know, in my studies of Ludlum, because unfortunately, Ludlum died right before I became aware of the theater of Ridiculous. And I did see mm -hmm. many ridiculous performances under the leadership of Everett Quinton, uh, who was uh, Charles Ludlum's uh, longtime partner and member of the theater of the Ridiculous. Uh, but I didn't get to see Ludlum perform, and that's a great mm -hmm. sadness for me. Uh, and so I've devoted a great deal of scholarship to Ludlam and the theater of the ridiculous. Uh, Ludlam also said, always go for the farce. And uh, that's also been a very, very uh, important, influential and inspiring instruction. Mm -hmm. Greg, uh, I legit got goosebumps because me and Nick yesterday were talking about how we can't keep you here forever. And we were like, but Ludlam, like, do we have a moment to talk about the theater of the ridiculous? And it all worked. Um, Nick, I just wanted to uh, say one thing before passing it to you. Um, Greg, when you were talking about the translation of the banner in a different language, I started thinking about Hans Hacke's uh, We Are All the People, just also on the banner when he had the retrospective uh, at the New Museum. And it had a Farsi translation. And I remember reading it and thinking that it's like, the grammar is a bit off and like, how perfectly it was translated, because like I, I couldn't settle on it. And it made you think about what do you mean by people? So that makes me think about all these different ways that you talk about like truth, communities, constitutions, partner. Uh, but yeah, it was really moving to then think about the translation of the AIDS crisis is still beginning. Because then you start thinking about the nuances of that sentence, like the stillness of it. Anyway, I'm rambling. Nick, take over. Um, I, as I said yesterday, I love your rambling, Yossi. Um, so I would like to ask you a question, Greg, about poetry, um, your connection to poetry and how poetry is uh, presented and utilized in the exhibition. Um, I really adored this work in the film, or I'm sorry, in the exhibition called Debris Fields from 2014. Um, and it is a series of 24 vinyl uh, poems uh, applied to the walls. And as Yossi mentioned, that red line at the beginning that runs throughout the exhibition, um, I actually didn't notice that at first, but I did absolutely notice these poems that uh, I saw as sort of like a guide through throughout each room, except for the video rooms, but, um, and sharing how I experienced it and then leading into a question. Um, I, I, I felt them very much as a passage, passage of time, not just because there's, there were 24 of them. And of course there are 24 hours in a day. Um, but uh, I also know you've said that you, you do them in the morning and you try to do them within 15 minutes. And they're a series of nouns uh, written Again, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe is similar to iambic pentameter. So um, they are very formulaic and sort of controlled, but also very um, automatic. Uh, so go anyway, going on, uh, the thing that I thought was really interesting of these was that their, their physical presence, which is almost, you know, the scale and at the same plane as the body going throughout the, the show, um, I, I saw them as a sort of a, 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 a passage of time, but also sort of like this membrane that was containing everything within the exhibition, like around the per perimeter of it, which was uh, containing all of these things that you've experienced and that you're sharing with us. Um, and then getting to the end of this, this rambling question, um, it, it made me think of something you mentioned in your essay, Operative Assumptions from 1996. 
where I'm not necessarily going to quote it, but you said that you approached as a young artist video because uh, you felt that video having uh, sound, image, time would be more effective than just a static image. But I thought that it was interesting that these, these text works to me, um, although you could consider them static, I felt that they had a similar sort of unfolding of a person or a subject that it was just as effective as maybe, you know, a time-based medium like film. And um, interestingly enough, in this photo, you know, there's the, the monitor of habit right in the middle of them. So my question really is, you know, um, can you talk a bit about your relation to poetry, how it's been a part of your practice? And I believe you said the other day how you're more comfortable in recent years uh, calling yourself a poet, although um, you've been writing for not just essays, of course, but um, poetry for quite a long time. And maybe even getting into a little bit of tenement, you know, of that as sort of a diary. Um, okay, <laughs> I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I to answer, I'll answer your questions in different pieces, maybe not in order. But uh, I started out. I was a child artist. I always wanted to be an artist. Um, in school, my pictures were put up in the walls in the cafeterias, and uh, I was uh, asked to participate in gifted and talented programs. I only ever wanted to be an artist maybe for a week, I, I said I wanted to be a lawyer because my parents thought that being an artist was not um, matching with my skills. And my family, uh, my family expected me to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a rabbi in that order. Um, the artist was not on the list. Um, I, I hate the sight of blood, uh, was not interested in being a lawyer. And um, rabbi was attractive, as my grandfather said, they give you a house. Uh, but uh, I, it, it wasn't in the cards either because I went through a period of alienation around religion, which has gone over many evolutions and revolutions throughout my life. So, but uh, in high school, I was the co-editor of the poetry magazine for my high school and uh, also made drawings for the cover of uh, that uh, uh, mimeographed uh, zine that the high school published. And uh, I've always written poetry. In the 80s, uh, me and many of my peers discovered uh, the New York poets late, uh, but you know we were very much interested in Frank O'Hara and uh, James Schuyler and, um, and uh, John Ashbery, all poets I admire very much. Uh, and that was part of a kind of queer reclamation. Uh, those of us who uh, faced the AIDS epidemic in the 80s uh, with older members of the community dying all around us or having had died in the late 70s and 80s were aware that we were not only losing friends and loved ones but culture uh, the theater of the ridiculous what would it, what did it mean that charles ludlam died um mm -hmm. What did it mean that the bathhouses were closed? I got to New York in 82 and the St. Mark's bathhouse was still open uh, and I went um, and so, but it was closed shortly thereafter. So I was aware in the West Village, I was very much an East Village uh, queer, Bohemian, uh, beyond labels. Uh, and uh, the West Village was clone culture and an established uh, gay culture, gay and lesbian culture. Um, and I would go over to the West Village to go to the piers, uh, to cruise, to go to bars, but I didn't really feel like I fit into that culture. And, but then in ACT UP, we really began to feel the loss of that culture. So we even adopted at the level of fashion, there's an image in the show of me kind of modeling ACT UP fashion. And we took the clone uniform back uh, so, you know, uh, polyester bomber jacket, baseball hat, earrings. Uh, I still have two holes in my ears. Um, and, uh, and we're also, you know, wearing uh, uh, bandanas, multicolored bandanas in our back pocket, which were used by gay men to signify certain proclivities and uh, preferences in anonymous sexual contact. 
uh, and we were also, you know, going to the ridiculous in its newfound form, looking at old uh, cultures. Uh, Douglas Crimp, uh, who was a dear friend and uh, fellow activist, uh, and one of my closest friends for 30 years, who died two years ago. Um, we, you know, we were friends for over 30 years, but in those days, Douglas was 20 years older than me. And he was one of a number of people who, you know, took me to the opera. I didn't, you know, where, where I came from, you know, people didn't go to the opera or listen to symphony. Um, and um, Douglas, you know, took me to my first opera. And, and uh, then I was around all of these quote unquote opera queens, which is what we used to call them. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, necessarily a term in use or a, term, a preferred term, but I got to hang out with all these opera queens. And, um, and you know, hang out in leather bars and uh, with Douglas and 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 see and you know see the remnants, not the remnants, but the the attempt to continue. And Douglas was very much about you know how to have promiscuity in an epidemic. That was one of his mm -hmm. famous essays, like how can we hold on to queer sex and and make them safer sex practices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were very much wanting to continue in the line of queer liberation. We wanted to continue queer liberation under a very different set of circumstances um, with a disease that was uh, sexually transmitted or transmitted through shared needle use. Um, and uh, so we began to reclaim what we felt was being lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and that extended to poetry too. I think, um, although I wrote poetry in high school in the 80s, I started writing poems that were very close to uh, O'Hara's poems, like Having a Coke With You or The Day Lady Died. And, you know, and, and that's how you teach yourself how to do something is, you know, through admiration and identifying mm -hmm. models. And, um, but my interests in poetry grew and um, you know, for the longest time, I really didn't get John Ashbery, but I decided I needed to. So I just banged my head against the wall of John Ashbery for years until something shifted. And yeah. I love John Ashbery. Uh, I understand John Ashbery. Uh, John Ashbery is like Gerhard Richter in that Ashbery <laughs> is trying to write every kind of poem, just like Richter mm -hmm. is trying to paint every kind of painting. Uh, when I understood that, I, I, you know, then I was let in and I always was always actually um, in my 20s also interested very much in Audre Lorde, um, uh, Pat Parker, June Jordan. Uh, I started to look at the poetry of um, uh, feminist poetry, uh, black poetry. Uh, I became very close with a group of poets named Other Countries, which was uh, a group of African-American gay men who were mm -hmm. under the influence of Audre Lorde uh, were writing poetry and produced journals called Other Countries about mm -hmm. being gay and black and HIV. That group was larger than just uh, cis men. Uh, it included mm -hmm. uh, trans people, although we didn't use that term trans at that time. Uh, Pamela Sneed wrote and was very close, the poet Pamela Sneed, whose book, recent book, Funeral Diva, which is an amazing book, I highly recommend it. I use uh, Pamela Sneed's F Funeral Diva published this year as a roadmap myself mm -hmm. to trace my past to my present. Pamela and I have been fellow travelers for a long time. So the other countries was very important to me and I was very influ influenced by Essex Hemphill and Marlon Riggs. So uh, po poetry, the mention of poetry, like the mention of art leads to genealogies. So I, I, mm. can't, I can't answer your question, Nick or Yazi, without you know, starting by unfolding a genealogy and trying mm. to fit myself within it like a constellation. I don't compare mm. myself to any of these uh, people. Uh, it's up for others to decide. Uh, and others have decided that perhaps I'm not one of those people. Mm. Uh, some people like my poetry. I am uh, really interested, in, and so for the past 15 years, I've been writing and publishing poetry. Debris mm -hmm. Fields it, um, is written with constraints. I like to write with constraints. Uh, the Debris Fields are 10 line um, poems that are made of uh, 10 syllable lines. I'm sorry, each line in Debris Fields is made up of 10 syllables which is Shakespearean, which is close to iambic pentameter, although 
I don't write an iambic pentameter, but I do adopt the 10 syllable rule and it's all nouns. Mm -hmm. um, initially, uh, and the way that Debris Fields, Debris Fields was written before uh, and was not a, a visual piece. I decided to turn it into a visual piece in Chicago. And in Chicago, I showed it much more as a, on three wheel, three walls. I showed it on three mm -hmm. walls in a much more monumental way. And I was really thinking of Maya Lin's uh, memorial to the Vietnam War dead. And so actually we chose a font that looks like a chiseled font mm -hmm. and uh, na names are, are proper nouns. So rather than names, I decided to just uh, list nouns and I list them associatively. I don't have a constraint for that. It just has to fit within 10 syllables. And I try to write them fast because under the pressure of speed, uh, not the drug, uh, which I no longer take, but uh, velocity uh, and quickness, you have to choose words. And, and sometimes you can't make the that word choice, their first word choice, because it doesn't scan. It doesn't fit within the mm. 10 syllables. So the pressure of writing fast, listing nouns, was a way of producing this kind of um, debris field, which I have to say is a title that I share with Glenn Ligon. Glenn Ligon has been making debris fields uh, as prints and now mm -hmm. paintings for as long as I've been writing these poems. When I wrote oh. these poems, I was not aware that Glenn had made his first prints, also called debris fields. A debris field is the area that you search in a plane crash or a tornado mm -hmm. to recover objects that have been scattered. Uh, in my case, I wrote these after my mother died. I was unable to write anything else. I, uh, I actually was commissioned to write a book for If I Can't Dance, which is an Amsterdam uh, cultural concern in, in the Netherlands. And uh, I could not write uh, except for these. I could only write these lists of nouns. And uh, I was aware that um, nouns, um, objects, um, well, I was basically going through my mother's stuff, you know, and when you, when, you, when you go through the stuff of anyone who's died, you have to handle, feel the weight, feel the contours of everything they touched and owned. And you also have to decide whether or not you're going to keep it or not, or whether they wanted you to keep it or what they want to do with it, their, their objects. And so my debris fields was very much about that. And I actually am writing about Glenn Ligon's paintings, debris fields, and their differences. Oh. Glenn and I had a funny conversation where I first saw one of his debris field paintings and I called Glenn up and said, hey, do you know, I wrote a set of poems called debris fields. He's like, well, when did you first write them? And I said, well, 2012. And he said, my first debris field print is 2011. Uh, and we laughed. And uh, then Glenn invited me to publish some of the debris fields in a catalog he did for Crusell alongside his painting. So we've since then actually in published form shown our debris fields together. Glenn's paintings are about the scattering of the alphabet and in some ways his abandonment of the gridded text paintings that he was doing previous to that. So these free floating, floating letter forms in a, a, on, a, on a ground. Um, and uh, they're brilliant paintings and you should look at them. Mine are very different. Mine are very much about, I'll repeat, monumentalization. I very much had, um, when I turned it into a visual piece, I very much had Maya Lin in mind. It was first presented as an edifice in that way. Um, now with Peter Ely, I like to work collaboratively with my curators at, at PS1. We decided to distribute them and create use the debris fields as one of those many recursive through lines that appear, disappear, and reappear throughout the show. Mm -hmm. Many people are intimidated by them. They're not easy to read. Um, and frankly, they're not meant to be, not because I'm purposely being difficult, but they are about objects, objecthood, mm -hmm. uh, the concrete. Uh, Anyone who's listening, if you go to see the show, um, you know, catching fragments, looking at them, being aware of their presence, both the red line and the scaled up body size uh, poems in the suite of poems are um, 
uh, also indebted to a kind of formalism. I'm, I'm thinking about mm -hmm. Daniel Buren and Michael Asher. Uh, they're markers on the wall. They occupy space on the wall. Uh, they point to or away from the neutrality of the wall. The red line is, uh, I'm very much in, in the polyvalent potentials of uh, the poems because uh, nouns are also verbs and adjectives. So the poems make a weird kind of sense because you can't tell if the word is functioning as a noun, a verb or an mm -hmm. adjective in many instances. So they make strange sentences uh, and uh, without uh, uh, prepositions or articles, uh, they do make a kind of sense uh, more imagistically than actually as words, although the words are producing the images. Mm -hmm. The red line um, is very much like uh, when you go to a big hospital and I would go to visit Douglas Crimp when he was in NYU Langone, I knew that I could get to his room by following the blue line and very large hospitals, you know, there's like follow the blue line, follow the yellow line, follow the green line. Mm -hmm. And you, you know which line, you know, blue leads to cancer, one mm -hmm. leads to cardio, one leads to another place. And so, um, so the red line, follow the red line. The red line is also taken directly from the racing stripe mm -hmm. of the race car that you showed in the beginning. It's a, a half inch red line that is to be installed three inches to the top above the floor uh, mm -hmm. and it wraps around every plinth uh, in the show. In Chicago, they allowed me to bring the red line out of two galleries across the courtyard into a third gallery. Uh, and so it also works as a way of like directing people to different parts mm -hmm. of the show. Other people have remarked that it's also a kind of a container. Peter Ely and mm -hmm. I came up with a set of constraints that the red line could only appear on what are the exterior walls. Mm. They're not exterior walls, but they're exterior, they're the outside walls mm. or the outside perimeter of the six rooms of the exhibition. And they're on every exterior wall, but not on the interior walls, but mm. they are on the plinth. Um, oh. And uh, that, like you're looking at the race car now, the, the, I, I like that the, as you move through the gallery and Nick, you're not alone, people become aware of the red line at different moments. But once you're aware of the red line, you can't not be aware of the red line. And the red line, because of perspective, produces different shapes than the squareness or rectangular shape of the gallery. So it produces this e extra layer of uh, parallelograms. Um, and I'm also very interested in shape and perception and even velocity. So I actually designed mm -hmm. the plinth that you're looking at for the race car. I designed it at those angles uh, rather than have perpendicular lines to accentuate. And, and you get this sense even more when you're in the space that the car could fly off mm -hmm. of its uh, plinth or resting place. Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. add, the addition of the stripe also accentuates that kind of angular directionality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think I'm rambling a bit. I hope I addressed some of your questions. <laughs> Again, yeah. fan of rambles, but now I literally have 85 questions. Um, no, it's really, there was something really moving. Uh, you mentioned the word fragments, and I do feel like it's really key to uh, this unique uh, exhibition and how it deals with a, a retrospective uh, that can hold contradictions. Um, it was really moving to see you talk about poetry and like all these different figures came up, you know? And I feel like, especially with your work, it feels important to think about Craig Owen. And uh, I was thinking about the intro to the AIDS crisis is ridiculous and how he writes about you writing about their community in the West Village. And, um, but it was also moving to think that about the generational conversation, about how then your generation started reperforming that to kind of embody this legacy. So, and I must say, I'm really intrigued to see, to one day uh, read your writing on Glenn, like on the debris of Glenn Ligon. There's something really moving about the way you write about other artists, which has been a consistent part of your practice. Um, 
And the other day I was thinking a lot about how can we even talk about your relationship to activism? Because obviously there's your early work, but there's the way where you have been mentors to so many people. There's been like teaching in your work. There's been all these ways that like you took care of your own mentors. And like, there's like all these um, deep cares that like, I don't know, sometimes I feel like the word activism falls short. But so I noticed uh, you use this word in your recent performances that are uh, transcribed and are gonna be published under a book called Some Aspects of Styles. Masculinity. Some Styles. 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 I was Styles. close, I was close. Yes. No, I made the mistake I constantly make. Some Styles of Masculinity and I wanna thank the Triple Canopy for giving us the early transcription. But there you talk about this line from Allen Ginsberg, uh, putting your queer shoulder to the wheel. And then I found you using this Ginsberg poem in another piece of writing about someone else. And for me, it was this beautiful way of thinking about your relationship to activism and your community's relationship to politics. So I'm gonna just read it. And then I have a question, but um, the poem is, again, it's, Alan, it's the final lines of Allen Ginsberg's America. America, this is quite serious. America, this is the impression I get from looking in the television set. America, is this correct? I'd better get right down to the job. It's true I don't want to join the army or, tear, or turn lates into precision parts, factories. I'm nearsighted and psychopathic anyway. America, I'm putting my queer shoulder to the wheel. And I, and I keep thinking about it's been really moving about how you invoke that line to talk about uh, your practice and then the practice of so many other people. So I was, and I mentioned this in our interview a year ago, even though I hadn't seen this, but I'm really intrigued by the room where you have the books, it's like the bookcases and a kind of a giant collection of your books. It's also a unique room because it's like, it's its own corner. It's a space where you can pause. Um, and this did travel to Chicago too. Um, and I'm really moved by it. And we talked about Nick about this too. I'm sure some people know this feeling that's like when you go to someone's house, the first thing you do is you look at their library. And within that, you find a sense of like your connections, like all these different ways of like shared authors that you're interested in. But also sometimes it even feels like you're looking for the books you're not going to find, especially when the books go to a space like a museum. I was noticing that in um, some styles too, in each you have, it's a, and you're going to have these performances for uh, PS1 too, but you play with these three uh, notions and each night you kind of like play with one of these characters, the rabbi, the rock star, the rabbi, the comedian. And there are all these things that repeat in all these three, uh, how you talk about your name, uh, how certain parts of your history repeats. And then in each of them, you have a set of books and you take a moment and you refer to the books and the books are different and not always in, in linear relationship to the subject we imagine you're gonna discuss, but it's interesting because you name the book and it's like, I'm like, oh, okay aren't Eichmann in Jerusalem and like that kind of sets the scene for me. I was thinking about what it means to be in this room, be witness to your books, but not pick them up, right? To spend time um, with the titles, with the lines, even with like what the books have become, like there are ones that are aged, there are ones that are older. Uh, and then in some of your writing, um, especially with New York is yesterday, I've noticed you play with writing about, you did an interview uh, with Delmore Schwartz. So you, you made this interview with a dead writer and the dead writer was not that enthused to talk to you. Uh, so there was really something really moving about like the conversation you had with this artist that you're fabricating. And in the next one, you had like Jesus talking about gentrification. Um, and you already talked about how your practice is influenced by so many. There's so many voices in your work. Um, Greg, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with ghosts and how they show up in your work in different ways. Non-capitalist ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, that's a very interesting uh, thing. I don't conceive of the dead as ghosts, although we can call them that for that reason, for the, the way that we use that term. I'm just, uh, I think because I'm one of many people who's endured a tremendous amount of loss and continue to do so as I get older, um, it was a surprise to me that I would survive HIV and that people would continue to die of HIV and, and many other things, uh, many other diseases. Uh, Douglas was HIV positive, but he died of uh, cancer. Um, so uh, some, I was kind of shocked by that. Um, so, but as many of you or all of you know, who've lost a dear person or persons, they're, they're always with you. Um, I have conversations uh, with people who I've lost because I love them so much and the conversations were so important that uh, I've internalized some notion or fantasy or reality. Uh, the, the conversations seem real to me where I'm in conversations with people all the time. I also have conversations with people who I'm just not in the, the room with. They're away or they're traveling or they pop into my head. It's also a way that I make work. I write often, especially poems, uh, thinking that I'm addressing a different person each line. Uh, so the mode of address changes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, am I talking to my mother? Am I talking to Christine? Am I talking to a complete stranger? Am I talking to this long dead friend? Um, and how would I explain this to each one of them? Um, mm -hmm. And so in that way, books are another way that we're in conversation with other periods of time, with authors, with people long gone, with people we don't know, who in their books quote other people who are gone or long dead or not uh, present. Uh, and so in that way, I think that we're always in conversation with the people who are present and absent in varying ways. Mm -hmm. A library, my library, this is a li my library from 1986 to 2013. It was in storage in Chicago. And um, initially there was a plan to have a kind of reading area uh, in the mm -hmm. exhibition that was attached to uh, a four chambered uh, room that was very, very well designed so that one could enter each room and uh, hear videos, watch videos without any sound interference. It was a remarkable feat of design. And it had a back end and that end was gonna be a, um, a long table with uh, stools for people to read from my books. In Portland, we did have a kind of successful reading room in that it was a, a college exhibition and we had a corner of the exhibition with comfortable couches and a stack of my books. And since it was a college um, exhibition, many other people came, but students in particular were the audience and they would come back and they watched all nine hours of the video that's mm -hmm. associated with the show in parts. They also would come back and lounge around and read my books and, um, so uh, in Chicago, I, I was talking to the exhibition designer and we decided it really wasn't a comfortable space. It was kind of at the mm. back end of this architecture. It was in the hallway that led to the exit door. I personally knew that I wouldn't feel comfortable sitting with my back to people constantly walking behind me. Mm. And, mm -hmm. But I did say, oh wow, there's a 10 foot by 30 foot recess in this mm. space that is going to fit my library. Mm. And then I began to think about portraiture. My friend Zoe Leonard, the artist, saw my show in all iterations. And in Portland, she saw the show and she said, Greg, you're a portraitist. I never knew this, oh. you're a portraitist. You know, you, you're, you, you make video portraits, you drew portraits of yourself. And the, you've always talked about the library as a portrait, which is true. Mm. I've always thought of the library. I can't get rid of mm. books. Uh, I know where and when I got each book. 80% uh, of the library is used books. It's not a precious library. I like reading books that are underlined by other mm -hmm. people. And, and that's a conversation. You buy a book that's used and it's underlined by someone else. You're, you're like, oh, thanks. I didn't know this, that. Or like, well, why did you underline that? You know, not that, you know, you know it's, it's like you're having a conversation with a, a, someone who's already read the book. And then I add my own underlines where they neglected to, uh, or not neglected, they, they didn't find something to underline there. 
So um, it's very, I think books are very much a conversation. This is a record of my personal reading life, but a reading life is always public. As you said, you go over to your friend's houses and look at their books. I love going to my friend's houses and seeing huge portions of our libraries reproduced. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel like I'm part of a group of people who went through a passage of time. This is a very somewhat dated library. There's not a lot of contemporary theory or the books that I'm mm -hmm. reading now. Libraries uh, pop up everywhere I live. Um, it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, I collect books. Hi, Greg. Uh, uh, it's just like I have to have books around me. I like physical books. I like. I also <laughs> I have an e-reader. I, I, I'm just reading a lot. But these books are, you know, if you look at these books, you think, oh, this person was like interested in Marxism at a very particular moment. And mm -hmm. or this person was reading queer theory at a very particular moment or post-colonial right. theory, feminism literature, the poetry, it's, it's all about a, a, a moment. Um, and it, as I said, many, many of my friends have portions of this, the, the, my library reproduced whole cloth in their own, not because mm -hmm. it's my library, because it's our public library. So it's a mm -hmm. record of reading lives mm -hmm. and uh, intellectual engagements, conversations. Uh, that tr mm -hmm. that, that's true of the ephemera room, which Nick showed a, a picture of before. Uh, in the ephemera room, I have that's on the far wall. Those are works uh, by the photographer Lee Chai, who's a friend of mine and who died of AIDS in the 90s. In the cases uh, that I actually gave uh, Peter Ely and Stephanie Snyder the ephemera, as I did in Chicago, I gave it to Robin Farrell and uh, Solvay Nelson. Uh, Stephanie did it in the Portland ephemera cases. That's the one story I can't tell. I have like three or four books mm. of ephemera and I just like have to hand it to the curator and say, just please tell the story. I don't know. Mm. So there's, there's mm. pictures of me with friends, old pictures, new pictures. There's old journals, which are not accessible anymore, like disease, disease pariah news, which was a humor journal for people oh. with AIDS. Uh, imagine that, a humor journal mm -hmm. for people with AIDS, mm -hmm. Disease Pariah News. Uh, I shared a great deal of affinity with Disease Pariah News because my caustic or corrosive uh, sense of humor around mm -hmm. HIV is very much attached to that, that mm -hmm. kind or a shared kind of humor, what people call a quote unquote gallows humor. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the ephemera is a testament to conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so the library is as well. Oh. And yes, the dead are always present. You know, they're in my dreams. Uh, I still walk down the street. You know, my friend Ray Navarro, who is, uh, I, I, we were friends. Now we were friends for far less amount of time than we've been having a conversation. Like he died in 1991. Mm -hmm. I still think of Ray. Um, mm -hmm. I see people on the street and I think, oh, there's Ray. And I remember, oh, he, Ray, Ray, can't be Ray, he's dead. Uh, that, it's not only Ray, that, that's, that's like with yeah. hun literally hundreds of people. Because right. um, I'm of that generation mm -hmm. passed through the epidemic at, in New York at that time when people were dying. Every ACT UP meeting started with a list of names of people who died that week. And they might've been mm -hmm. people who were at the meeting the week before. Right. They, they might've been people, you know, the people were just dying so quickly and rapidly and, and, and showing up to the meetings until they possibly couldn't show up anymore. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I, it's not like, you know, like, a, like, like in the movies, I see dead people. It's, it's really yeah. much more psychological and phantasmatic, mm -hmm. uh, but it's real. It's real to yeah. me. It's real to me. Mm -hmm. When I sit down and I talk to, I just recently visited Douglas Crimp's grave on the two year mm -hmm. anniversary of his death. And I just, I, I just talk to Douglas. You know, I just talk oh. to Douglas like we're talking and I can oh. have a conversation because I've internalized 30 years of conversation. I mean, Greg, I think that's something that is really moving in, in this exhibition, a lot of your work, but now and everything coming together, there's so many voices. There's like so many echoes and even as someone who's a different generation, right? I can be 
present with them. Anyway, Nick. Well, it's it's I have to just have to say it's intergenerational too. There are recent yeah. videos. There are two recent mm -hmm. videos. And the most recent video is a collaboration I did with a dear friend of mine, a younger friend by 20 years, as I was to Douglas. Douglas was 20 years older than me. My friend Morgan Basicus is 20 years younger than me. And we made a video together and I decided to include that collaboration in the show. I'm very interested in um, intergenerational conversations. You mentioned that I'm a mentor or an elder. I, I, it's been, it's been, I've had to deal with this kind of elder status, but um, uh, Morgan asked me to do an interview for his, a group that he's involved with, the Jewish Voices for Peace. And I gladly did it as an activist, an experienced activist, but then Morgan said, oh, the, the interview is up. Uh, you can go see it. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, and then I went to the YouTube page and it was like, interviews with our queer elders. And uh, I was like, whoa, when did I become a queer elder? And <laughs> then I was also lecturing at Bard <laughs> during the pandemic on Zoom. And I don't think this young student saw those interviews, uh, but the young student addressed me and said, Greg, I'm so glad you're here, um, much respect. Uh, as a queer elder, that was like the lead into the question. So I'm coming in to my status as a queer elder. Um, Greg, did you all ever do that to Douglas Prim or no? Yes, yes and no, um, yes and no. I mean, Douglas and I, I have been very fortunate to have relationships with mm -hmm. Douglas and Yvonne Rayner and Lynn Tillman, mm -hmm. uh, Dee Fagan, who I see is here in the audience. These are people who are uh, slightly older than me or older than me who I've sought out to have yeah. conversations with, who kind of were mentors, but in order to then become friends, we had to shift gears. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't you can't be the mentor mentee forever, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so Douglas and I shifted, and we t taught each other a lot. Uh, and same for the other people I mentioned. Um, all of them were very very helpful to me and very very supportive to me. When I was a younger artist, they kind of took me under their wing. Um, and at some point, because we were getting older and I matured as an artist, those relationships, fortunately, I'm very fortunate and grateful to them, turned into friendships. Nice. And that's the same thing with, the, I have many younger friends um, and uh, in order for us to continue to be mm -hmm. in dialogue and even in the intergenerational dialogue, mm -hmm. there, there has to be some kind of switch where we mm -hmm. don't pretend that there's the age difference. We don't pretend mm -hmm. that that doesn't exist, that we're like the same age. We, you, can't, you can't defeat that. You don't want to. That's like part mm -hmm. of the value of the conversation. But there has to be some shift in higher, hierarchy or deference. Douglas mm -hmm. Crimp was the model. Doug, I mm -hmm. met Douglas you know, I was, you know, 23 or so, he was 43. Yeah. He listened to me. You know, mm -hmm. there were other older people around me in ACT UP who are like, you'll never be as radical as we were. Oh, you know, yeah. we, you know, that, that, and this kind of thing yeah. where they, they had to hold on to their past, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, to feel some sense of um, themselves. And uh, the, the people that I mentioned, my mentors, always listened, were generous mm -hmm. enough to, to listen, and were genuinely interested in what a younger people, person had to say, or generally, genuinely patient watching me mm -hmm. and others reinvent mm -hmm. the wheel, even oh. they knew, though they knew how to build the wheel, they realized that we had to build it for ourselves. And yeah. I, I, Douglas is a model for that, and I try to follow that. Yeah. So beautiful. I want to, I put in the chat not, not too long ago, the beautiful uh, text you wrote on Douglas uh, Crimp for art form that I highly encourage everyone to read. And in uh, honor of that last night when Yasi and I met to, to, to go over talking about this, I brought cans of Budweiser. Um, we didn't have bacon wrapped meatloaf, but Maybe I'll invite someone over and have that. Um, I, never had bit, bacon, I never had bacon wrapped meatloaf until I went over to Douglas's house. It, it really wasn't <laughs> on the border with his family menu. <laughs> <laughs> but it might, it, it's going to come back. Um, remarking on what you, uh, something else you'd said though, um, 
I it's I feel like most of your work, Greg, I see it as a portrait, not formally, but it is a portrait of a person or of a moment. Um, what we're what we have on screen is, was one of the highlights of the show for me. The fast I want it's 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 beautiful. Um, and I, for the in the sake of for time, uh, I know we're kind of running out of time here, and we're going to go to Q and A in just a moment. Um, I'm. I'm going to kind of skip through. I had wanted to ask you about spirituality, but I feel like you've, mm. you've kind of gone over that a couple of times. So apologies to kind of glance by these, but um, I was thinking we could maybe end, uh, I don't want to say briefly, because I don't want to not do justice to the work, but um, I feel like it, we, we have to acknowledge this new work that was created mm. for the show. And um, perhaps, um, you could say a few words about this, and Yasi, if you have any other questions. Um, uh, that yeah, prefer. and this this is kind of my final question or thought, and it is related to this piece. Um, Greg, I was very fortunate to have a walkthrough with you uh, when the show opened, and I think later on, I sent you an email. I was like, I'm really intrigued by this almost like this monumental exhibition that refuses to be a monument. And there's something about this sculpture that really made me think about that. The other day I mentioned this to you in the upcoming book, you always play with music and like music has been a significant part like from your early writing and practice to this day. Uh, but they have these transcripts for the different songs you play in your performances and all the transcripts you read them, and if you know the song, you can hear it. And if you don't, it's just language. But there was one part where you had played, as you said, a wordless prayer. So it's a prayer that is full of utterance. And then, and what we had was a working transcript. But at this moment, the transcript just said music break, which is a fascinating language around this text that was like full of music break. But this time it wasn't in language. For me, this room with this sculpture that is makeshift and monumental and it feels like it can fall apart um, and it grows and it's filled with clouds and it makes me think about what it means to take over a square. It made me, made me think about that musical break or everything that in your work that is almost on the margins of language, like as much as you care about language to think about like, enunciation, utterance, repetition, in a weird way that's really related to what Nick was saying about like the deep spirituality in all of these, even though I'm not sure if that's the right word for it. Um, yeah, I would also love to hear about this sculpture um, and music breaks. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to tie them together, but I'll address them both. This sculpture, I, I, I've come up with a rule. I don't know if the, um, since I added pieces in Chicago, I decided that I'm gonna add a new piece to every iteration of the show. This might be the last time this show uh, exhibits. It might travel. There's some discussion about that to Europe. Um, so I wanted to do something, and I also wanted to do something that uh, addressed uh, both the history and legacy of, the, of HIV activism and HIV epidemic and current circumstances under COVID. And so uh, this sculpture is loosely based on the plague column in Vienna, which is from the 1600s. It's a 64 foot marble sculpture uh, that is a column of Baroque clouds with figures, religious and tortured figures in and out of the clouds um, commemorating the uh, bubonic plague. Um, and uh, so I made sketches and I lived in Vienna and, and saw that sculpture every day. And so I made sketches uh, for a sculpture that is at, as big as that room could bear. Uh, it's uh, just under 12 feet, the ceilings are 12 feet. Uh, and it's really a combination of the legacy of HIV the, uh, and the protests, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, and um, COVID, uh, deaths from COVID. And uh, many of my friends were ill, uh, got ill. Uh, many people died. I live in Crown Heights, uh, one of the hotspots, uh, I think in a two week period in last July, uh, five of my neighbors were taken away by ambulances. 
Um, so I was, I wanted to do something. And so uh, PS1 was very generous and supported this by giving me fabricators and buying materials and uh, using sketches and showing uh, the fabricators uh, pictures of like Red Grooms' work, uh, who has an artist I like very much, um, and, and some other pop artists. I was thinking about Roy Lichtenstein's uh, uh, The Painted Shadows on Mannequins the, with Bende dots. Um, this is called Pest Soil or Plague Column for Urban Torn. Urban Torn was an artist who, a Jewish artist who lived in Vienna when I lived there and we became close. And uh, he made, was an abstract artist who painted shaped canvases and he would place a light on the canvas, paint in the shadows and then remove the light so that the, the structured canvas uh, did not match up and the shadows didn't match up, the painted shadows didn't match up with the gallery lighting. So that's exactly what I did uh, with two fabricators, though I had was very hands-on and working every day with them with chicken wire, paper mache, gypsum bandages, uh, cut styrofoam, uh, three colors of Benjamin Moore paint that I chose, and, and some detritus uh, and structural things we found in the basement at PS1. Uh, uh, I constructed this sculpture and um, in the room in which it's exhibited, it could come apart. It's made in three sections. I don't know how much it will survive uh it's it will have to be rebuilt uh if it's ever to be shown anywhere else uh but i'm really um grateful for the opportunity to do that so i painted in the i, I painted in the shadows twice once with purple black and once with yellow and uh, uh by moving the lights and moving and but you can see here that actually what i'm painting is the shadows of the ladder i was standing on uh, you can see that in the yellow and uh, purple black part on the uh, your right. Uh, and um, the figures are all taken from the plague monument, uh, somewhat abstract on the back uh, and more representational in the front, although I'm, I'm aware that sculptures don't have backs or fronts, so but there is a kind of split. And uh, the museum requires a kick base uh, for good reason. Uh, lots of people, it's a show, it's up for a long time. People tend to get close to sculptures and um, leave footmarks. But instead of having a kick base, I just asked for 40 sandbags and uh, put sandbags around it to even further and amplify the sense of a kind of impending flood or impending mm -hmm. uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, there is a person holding a blank protest sign in the plague monument. That figure is holding a huge cross. I was not mm. interested in uh, producing a, there is vague uh, religious iconography throughout. The clouds are kind of religious iconography, but the uh, protest sign is blank. And I was very interested in having this um, non-signifying signifier. Mm. Uh, we had extra uh, uh, cloud shapes and uh, there's another sculpture that I made earlier, uh, like at least 10 years earlier, that was also interested in Baroque clouds uh, for, I'll just say very quickly, I'm fascinated with Baroque clouds. When I was in Vienna and in Europe, I made a point to study the Baroque. Baroque clouds, I would go into these churches where there would be paintings of the sky and clouds on the ceiling and then on the walls, the paintings would continue into three-dimensional cloud mm -hmm. shapes. It almost looked like someone went through the uh, church with a huge uh, pastry bag and just, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, and Baroque clouds are interesting because they're like cloud emojis. They don't look in any way like mm -hmm. realistic clouds. And yet they like, you immediately understand it as a cloud. So I was uh, interested in that. Uh, the, the clouds are then migrated to the wall and I, that's kind of where the exhibition ends. Uh, and it's more of a tableau, even though it's a sculpture that you can walk around in and it yields from every position, I believe. But I was also, I'm also very interested in the theatrical. To tell you the mm -hmm. truth, as I was making this to show you like how I have to overcome my history, as I was making this every day, I was telling myself, forget Michael Fried, forget Michael Fried. Forget Michael Fried. 
I don't have time to explain that for those of you who have, who have read Art and Objecthood years ago and suffer from this, <laughs> uh, uh, this uh, imperative to make sculpture that's not theatrical. I've always thought there's something <laughs> vaguely uh, homophobic in that. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've read it that way. So mm -hmm. I, um, uh, it's theater. In fact, I would tell the fabricators, the fabricators were so much more talented than me uh, that they would want to finish to a greater degree. And I would, I would just say, uh, it's good enough for theater, which actually comes out of the theater. You know, it, mm. not people aren't gonna see it up close. It's, you know, it's a background, it's good enough for theater. So, <laughs> you know, when, when they would get okay. really focused on their craft, I would just say good enough for theater and we'd move on. Amazing. Uh, so, uh, and it was actually built, this is, you, this is the point of view that you enter the room, there's debris fields behind it. And then there's a couple other drawings. We don't have time to talk about the other <laughs> drawings and stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't think we should, because uh, I want to get to questions. The question of spirituality. Um, I have always, uh, I'm Jewish. I'm a practicing Jew. Uh, Judaism, my Judaism has been central to the formation of my identities. It was the first sense I had of being an outsider. Even though I grew up in a large Jewish community, I grew up in a very diverse uh, part of Queens uh, uh, with uh, African-American neighbors, uh, South Asian neighbors, uh, Latinx, Puerto Rican, Dominican neighbors. What bound us together, I'm very grateful for that, uh, that background, uh, for being raised in Queens in that way. Uh, the binding element in my neighborhood was class. We were all working class, uh, uh, single parents, our parents working many jobs. Uh, basically the one goal we all shared was to get out of that neighborhood and a uh, rough neighborhood. And, um, but I spent a long time there. It took a long time for my parents to get out. Uh, again, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I don't know how that exactly ties to spirituality. Except I, I was bar mitzvahed in an Orthodox temple. Not many people know this. I, ha I have an Orthodox Jewish background and I have uh, traveled um, very far away from it and come back closer to it uh, in my films. In all of my films, there are references to Jewish culture and uh, Judaism, uh, the Torah, the Talmud. I've been uh, least interested in the question of nationalism. I'm interested in the notion of a, a Jewish people. Uh, I'm very comfortable in the diaspora. I, I don't claim any home other than Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, I oppose the occupation. Why I have to tell you this, I don't know. Everyone should know that there's three categories, Jews, Israelis, and Zionists. I'm one of them. I'm an American Jew. I only have a passport to this country. And I um, actually, I know too much to be anti-Zionist because I know there, is a, there are Zionisms. And there was a history of Zionism that lost but there was a group of people who wanted to live communally with the inhabitants of Palestine. They lost, um, and um, but I uh, uh, and I'm very much involved with Israel-Palestine po politics and support Palestinian self-determination and self-rule, and, and a truly democratic Israel where everyone who lives in in Israel-Palestine is an enfranchised citizen under a democratic, a truly democratic government. Um, but I've not really focused much on the national character and don't in my work. Uh, I probably have said more now than I say in the exhibition. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for that powerful statement. Um, I thank think you. I think this is it. I think we're ready to open to Q&A. Thank you so much, Greg. Now I have a million more questions for you, but. Well, our I, conversations can continue. You know, we have I the privilege. You. We have the privilege of you and Nick and I live in the same neighborhood. We can share figs. Uh, <laughs> Malibu, I have now you're we're invited dying. to share in the fig tree that Christian <laughs> and I have in our front yard. I uh, have I have questions for us to to go over at the Shirley Chisholm bench area of Broward Park. So um, <laughs> okay. I, I, I just also want to say thank you so much, Greg, for your time and your generosity today. Um, but let's open it up to, to the audience. All right, perfect. Um, thank you all so much. I, I, Greg and Yassi, I feel like I've been, I have a thought in my mind about figs and, and diaspora. 
that I've been holding in my mouth for so long, but I'll save it for our, our camping picnic. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Greg, Yassi, Nick. Um, such a beautiful conversation. And I'm so intrigued and moved by so much of what you've shared today about legitimation processes, fictional publics, and that kind of made me think so much about you know, what Lee Edelman says about uh, how speculative children are presented as the future, the, the protection of whom is invoked in the policing of so many bodies. Um, and Greg, also, you know, everything you said about uh, grief and how the dead are always present. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Nick to uh, moderate the rest of the Q&A shortly because I have a memorial to go to, but I'm going to kick it off with um, our first question will come from our publisher and the captain of this fine ship, Fong Bui. And Fong, you can take it right away. I also think of Edward Denby, you know? Yeah. And who's writing on dance and also a terrific poet, not as well known, but in any rate, they all four gay and prominent New York school poets and whose lives and work were deeply tied to the space that connect between visual culture and their um, poetic aspiration. And I thought of your work very much in tradition of Baudelairean flaneur, you know, as claiming, I know my city well, I know my museum well, I know myself well, I know my neighborhood well, you know, there's a strong sense of uh, aesthetic beauty and all, in, you know, in, in the city, so to speak. You know, we, we often say this thing to ourselves to justify our, you know, fast paced lifestyle and all the difficulty that go along with it. You know, we really rarely stop to appreciate beauty in that particular mo movement, movement and moment in a way. And, and I, I remember beauty can be initiated, you know, from having read that tradition from the general to the particular. Mm -hmm. And Baudelaire discussed the dualistic nature of beauty inherent in all forms, the internal invariable element, for example, relative circumstantial element. And why the concept beauty also is the opposite, the timeless beauty subject you know, the pleasure of all of it, you know, the ever-changing nature of staying present, you know. So I feel your social activism is related more to the general, whereas your poet, poetry and your autonomous object are more close to the particular. But most importantly, compassion and beauty are one coexistent condition to me, it feels. So thank you so much, Greg. I'm coming back this Saturday with a bunch of friends for a third visit. Can't wait. And so congratulations on a big show. Can't wait to see you in flash in person. And Laszlo, I, I missed you because I got to go this uh, meeting, but I will tune in for the second reading, watching with pleasure. So um, bye you guys. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Fong, so much. Thank you. Can't wait to see Thank you. Thank you, Fong. Bye you guys. Fun. Ciao. Ciao. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to the Rails' own art books editor, Megan Liberty. Uh, Megan, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Thanks, Nick. And thank you, Greg, for being here. It's great to see you again. It's been a while. Um, I've uh, you've talked so much during this whole thing about a lot of aspects of your practice from your videos and uh, poetry, but something you kind of touched on towards the end there when you were bringing up Debris Field is actually how we know each other through Glenn Ligon. So I was curious if you could comment a little bit on your scholarship as an aspect of your practice, thinking about how your writing on other artists relates to the rest of your work. I know in my own criticism, I think think a lot about how to uplift other voices, which kind of chimes a little bit with your notion of witness. So how do you see your scholarship playing into the rest of your practice? Thanks so much. Thank you, Megan. That's an excellent question. It's really nice to see you on Zoom. Um, writing for me, I, I started writing criticism very early uh, in my career, in my 20s. Um, and um, it was a way and continues to be a way for me to just, again, be in conversation around art. And I learned a tremendous amount from the effort of putting into words, uh, feelings and thoughts I have about other people's work. It's a way of, of participating in a community. Uh, long ago, I abandoned writing any negative criticism. In my twenties, I wrote a couple of uh, really nasty pieces about work I didn't like. And, 
I decided that was life's too short and well, that's, that's a really funny thing to say about my youth. But um, I decided that there wasn't enough time to, uh, I just didn't want to engage that kind of energy. So actually, as a critic, I only write about work that I'm interested in, uh, only work that excites me, uh, work that I have a lot to say about, uh, work that poses challenges to me. But I, I'm not the kind of critic who evaluates work on the basis of some kind of criteria uh, of good or bad or historical importance or uh, it's really about um, language and creating language around an adjacent object or experience. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, I did actually, I, I, um, I don't have a college degree. Uh, we don't have to go into that. I dropped out of college to become an AIDS activist full time. But I am very familiar with scholarship and it goes back to uh, being uh, in an Orthodox Jewish school uh, to, for my bar mitzvah. I, I actually learned about inductive reasoning, reasoning and deductive reasoning. These are all these things you learn when you study Torah. Uh, so I had a very early introduction to what it means to read, write, and be, an engage, be engaged with the, a record of uh, commentary. And so that is very much the root and reason of my scholarship. So thank you for asking for that, asking that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all the help you gave me on the book I wrote about Glenn's painting untitled, I Am a Man, 1988, my after all book. Thanks, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I have to say, I too have a hard out uh, at three o'clock. Uh, so unfortunately I can't stick around to answer any more questions. No, I thank you, Greg, for ah. the time you have given us today. Um, yeah. I sorry, I interrupted you though. No, that's it. I just wanted to say thank you so yeah. much. Uh, thank you awesome. so much, Greg. Thank you. Thank and you, thanks Greg. everyone for being here. It's been it's been an honor twice now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll we'll continue. We'll continue. Over we'll be continued. In, in we'll be continued. Part. And thank you all for being here and being present. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege. Thank you very much. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Um, well, it's the Rails tradition to end all of our events with a poem, uh, usually a poem, but today we're going to do a musical performance. Um, Laszlo, you have an intimate crowd, but you still have a crowd. And um, I'm going to give a quick bio for us that... Um, it's my honor to welcome Laszlo to the stage and musician Laszlo Horvath lives and works in New York with his band Laszlo and the Hidden Strength. So Laszlo, the, uh, the floor is yours. Hi. Yeah, no, th this is great. I mean, um, this is a new song uh, anyway that I'm going to play. So it's great to uh, have, an, have, a, have a, a small crowd that I can workshop this in front of. So yeah, thank you. No, thank you so much for for having me play. This song is called, um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Let cool. me clear. This song is called um, uh, T-shirt. Everyone is mad at your T-shirt. Heaven's house, symmetrical in rage. First there was the fashion, and then it had a face. You can imagine what they did say. I know that you want to get us famous. And get us to put up the new lights in your house. I don't you say you want new ones to play with? How do you think you do picks up the tax? Charm to death, six degrees. No doubt of ability to relax, to relax. Everyone is mad about your t shirt. Heaven's house, symmetrical in rage. First there was the fashion, and then it had a face. You can imagine what they say. Don't look now.
now that everyone is watching. Colors are adhering to their gaze. Look around the gallery, maybe I'll be saved. Paranoia in case. She treats me like a melody that ought to learn a lesson, tortured as it sings. And hide in the sidelines of the models. All the models say, drink, drink it up. Only one way to tell what's at the bottom, the bottom, bottom, bottom of the cup. Drink, drink it up. Only one way to tell. What's at the bottom, the bottom, bottom, bottom of the cup? Charmed to death, six degrees, stormed out of ability to relax, to relax. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Laszlo. Um, the workshop, um, I think the results are that it's good. You should keep <laughs> um, thank you so much for that playing that for us today. And thank you, Greg, for sticking around to listen to the music. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you, Nick. Of course. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, now that it's actually just the few of us, I, I'm like, uh, we actually should give a little shout out in this small room to Sophia. I think, Sophia, yes. is, this your, is this your final NSC? Wee. Okay, well, I gotta text you. Sherry, I, I just have to acknowledge in this archival moment, sharing love to As Sophia. a staff member. Um, yes, but I'll be back. You'll be, you've been integral to it, so I may have shattered a fourth wall. And we even had our moment of absurd theater here today. <laughs> what um, do you mean? This happens all the time. <laughs> uh, well, I, for the sake of the archive, I have to read from the script and say, uh, thank you everyone so much for joining today. Um, I want to thank you, Greg, Yasi, Laszlo for joining us. Um, next week, The Rail is doing something new and taking a little break. As we all know, it's been quite a year and we're excited to be taking a moment to catch our breath. However, we are also excited to announce our summer series, which will be celebrating the sections of The Rail with a series of daily conversations, performances of dance, theater, and more. Uh, curated by our wonderful section editors. This two-week summer series will offer a view behind the scenes with the editors, artists, and writers that make our publication everything it is. So go over to brooklynrail.org slash events to check out each event to RSVP, and uh, we hope you enjoy them. And wishing everyone a very happy summer, and we'll see you in August. And the 10 of us can unmute now <laughs> and say hello and goodbye. So. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Have a great summer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yossi. Thank you, Yossi. Oh, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Yossi. You can 50% of the package. And thank you for the package. Thank you for being our biggest fan, GE. Oh,